All the speakers have to come here because uh, for the viewers who are watching us uh, in the virtual mode, uh, the speaker has to come here so that the speaker is visible to the viewers outside. This is not a hybrid. This is a physical event, but uh, for the benefit of those who are living outside Delhi, we have created a Zoom link and request all the speakers to come to the dais while they are speaking, making comments. Vandana is there. Vandana, you have to come here. She's there. A very good evening to all of you on behalf of India International Center. I extend a warm welcome to the distinguished panelists and to all of you who have joined us this evening for this book discussion uh, that we're going to discuss the Arab Spring that was and wasn't by Ambassador K.P. Fabian. To discuss this book, we are joined by a very uh, illustrious uh, well, uh, list of panelists. We have with us Professor Kulshan Dedel, who is uh, going to chair and moderate the session. Uh, Professor Dedel is was formerly at the School of International Study, Jawaharlal Nehru University, where she served uh, also served as the director of the Gulf Studies program and the chairperson of the Center for West Asian and African Studies. A Fulbright Scholar uh, in residence at the Mount St. Mary College, uh, Newark, New York during 1993-94, and a guest research fellow at the Copenhagen Peace Research Institute during 1998-99. She's been a visiting professor at the University of Kashmir at the Foundation de la Maison des Sciences, which we uh, commonly um, christen as FMSH Paris, uh, Jamia Milia Islamia, and she has uh, published several books that includes uh, Contemporary so uh, Saudi Arabia and the Emerging Indo-Saudi Relations in 2007, Democracy and De Democratization in the Gulf 2010, and India and the Global Game of the Gas Pipelines 2017. Welcome, Professor Bethel. We also have with us Ambassador T.C.A. Raghavan, who has a PhD from, in history from Jawala Nehru University. He has been High Commissioner of India to Singapore and to Pakistan. He retired from the Indian Foreign Services in 2015, and his several books to his credit, his book, first book is on Attendant Lords by Ram Khan and Abdul Rahim, Courtiers and Poets in Mughal India, uh, that was awarded the Muhammad Habib Memorial Prize for the best book on medieval Indian history by the Indian History Congress in 2017. He's also the author of The People Next Door, The Curious History of India's Relations with Pakistan, 2017. Welcome, Ambassador Raghavan. We have also with us Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed, uh, Ambassador Ahmad joined the Indian Foreign Services in 1974. Early in his career, he was posted in a number of West Asian countries such as Kuwait, Iraq, and Yemen. And later, between 87 to 19, he was Council General in Jeddah. He also held positions in the Indian missions in New York, London, and Pretoria. He served as in, uh, Indian Ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Oman, and the UAE. The Saudi Arabia government conferred on him the King Abdul Aziz Medal First Class for his contribution to the promotion of Indo-Saudi relations. Currently, he is the Ram Sethi Chair in the International Studies Symbiosis in International uh, University, which is a deemed university. He has published uh, three books uh, that includes Reform in the Arab World, External Influences and Regional Debates in 2005, Children of Abraham at War, The Clash of uh, Messianic uh, Malaysia 2010 and the Islamist challenge in the West Asia. Welcome, uh, Ambassador Emma. We are 
the author of the book, uh, Ambassador KP Fabian, uh, who has served as the Indian Foreign uh, in the Indian Foreign Service between 1964 and 2000, during which time he was posted to Madagascar, Austria, Iran, Sri Lanka, Canada, Finland, Qatar, and Italy. He is currently a distinguished fellow at Symbiosis University. During his time in the diplomatic service, he spent three years in the Iran witnessing the Iranian revolution firsthand. As Joint Secretary Gulf, Ambassador Fabian coordinated the evacuation of over 176,000 Indian nationals from Iraq and Kuwait in 1990-91. His multilateral experience includes representing India at the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, International Atomic Energy Agency, International Civil Aviation Organization, Food and Agricultural Organization, World Food Program, and the International Fund for Agricultural Development. Welcome, Ambassador Fabian. We also have with us uh, Ms. Vandana Juneja, who is Director, Sales Macmillan Education. Welcome, Vandana. Thank you very much. Now, I just hand over the baton to the chair of the program, please. Well, friends, <clears throat> it's customary to say I'm privileged, it's a pleasure to be here, but I truly do mean it today. I mean it because the book under discussion is a very special book. Just look at the title of the book. Arab Spring was and wasn't for Many years, people have written about the Arab Spring, and the smart analysts have said, was it Arab Spring or has it been Islamic winter? Fabian G is going even further and saying, was there Arab Spring at all, or was it an, was it an optical illusion? But he doesn't say there was no Arab Spring. He says there was Arab Spring and there wasn't Arab Spring. Why does he not say was or wasn't? He says war and wasn't. How do you explain was and wasn't? So towards the very end of the book, he explains with the Jain philosophy. And the explanation is very simple. The social realities are not binary. They are not exclusive. This or that, white or black. There are nuances, there are things changing, there are complications, there are layers. And therefore, Arab Spring was and wasn't. So the book ends with the Jain philosophy and guess how it begins. The book begins with Shakespeare. And lo and behold, within the text, it's not just Shakespeare, but it is also an Arab lady Sufi philosopher. It's the Greek god of war, Athena. It is T.S. Eliot, it is Wordsworth, and so many top-ranking literature um, figures who make short appearances and enrich the text. Fabian G was there very often. So he was on the roads, he was watching the street protests. And since he was a diplomat, he also had access to the decision-making rooms, the board rooms. Therefore, the book takes us into the middle of the mayhem during the Arab Spring, and it also takes us to the closed door 
consultations as they were going on. So it's a going to be a very, uh, it, it is a very interesting book and it is going to be something that is going to be uh, invoking a lot of curiosity, not just here who are listening, but also people who would be motivated to look and read the book. As per the program, we have two speakers and the author of the book. And the author of the book is listed the last. So that's okay. But if I can request the author, Ambassador Fabian, to briefly introduce the book, and then the speakers will discuss the book. Of course, Ambassador Fabian will also have the last word, but a short uh, introduction will help. I think. Would you? Okay, come. Good evening, book lovers in abundance and having come from, even from Gurugram, but that is partly because uh, who can resist uh, the invitation from uh, our chief librarian? Thank you, Dr. Usha, for uh, your kind words. Well, starting from 1964, so I am certainly the youngest around here. Uh, can everyone hear me well? Dear uh, Dr. Gurshan Deetal, dear colleague uh, Ambassador Rakhavan, <coughs> Director from Macmillan uh, Vandana <coughs> Tunisia, and uh, my neighbor and colleague. Uh, Ambassador Talmi Samad and uh, dear friends, and uh, I recognize so many friends. <laughs> now, I've been asked to say only very briefly to introduce the book. Okay. The chair has already mentioned about the seven valued Jain logic. I just want to add that uh, that occurred to me at a lunch given by our ambassador in Cairo, uh, Navdeep Suri, and uh, I had two Egyptian ladies sitting on either side, and they asked me, what is the title of your book? So I suddenly had to think of something. <laughs> in fact, they were surprised that I wanted to write a book at all about that. Um, I also noticed that uh, in the diplomatic corps, in uh, Cairo, none of the ambassadors had foreseen, anticipated that this was going to happen. They all thought that Mubarak was going to be there forever, just as the BBC thought. Anyway, now, I should have completed this book long time ago, 2014, October, according to the ICW contract. But then you see, after watching two acts of Macbeth, can you write on Macbeth's character? Or even for that matter, Lady Macbeth? And in fact, this uh, unscripted drama is still continuing, you know, and we are still visiting. I just want to share with you one thought, and that is that uh, when from Tahrir Square, there was a demand for Mubarak to step down. And uh, when he fled, for a moment I thought, you know, that reminded me of the words of uh, Wordsworth, you know, what a bliss was to be in that dawn and to be young was very heaven. That was 1790, French Revolution. So I also thought, you know, well, that was a real revolution. But Mubarak 
fled not only because of the thunder from 30 square but also because the scarf supreme command of the armed forces what shall i say court invited him and court to leave because his son well they thought he was planning to make his son succeed him and for the egyptian military to have a civilian as president absolute anathema well moving on egypt reversed in fact uh, what else is even worse than mubarak <laughs> syria well very briefly there was a time when uh, the russians had told the americans and others we can do something and make uh, uh, make bashar al assad leave but they said no no why he would leave in any case but i think i will stop here because uh, i am very eager to listen to what uh, my colleagues and my friends the book lovers have to say and uh, the chair will permit me to speak once again thank you so much Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm very grateful to Dr. Usha Munshi for and to the IIC for having invited me uh, to be part of this uh, wonderful panel for the launch of Ambassador Fabian's. a new book on the arab spring so delighted to be with uh, dr gulshan detil ambassador talmiz ahmed uh, vandana juneja and of course all of you to share my thoughts now i am not an arabist unlike ambassador fabian and ambassador uh, talmiz ahmed so i'm glad he is going to talk uh, after me ambassador talmiz ahmed because once he had spoken there would be very little for me uh, to say but i really have enjoyed reading the book i remember i read a earlier draft when i was in the icwa so this is a wonderful read which anyone can dip into it takes uh, gives you a broad bird's eye view of the whole uh, region uh, stretching from our immediate neighborhood in the gulf all the way to north africa to egypt and libya and morocco uh, oh yeah so Uh, so but i don't have to repeat what i said no yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so it gives a wonderful bird's eye view of what happened uh, and i uh, as our chair said particularly like the title because did something happen in 2011 uh, and that really is a uh, is an important question because it is not 2011 which otherwise is uh, summed up as being uh, arab spring doesn't stand out as some other fundamental uh, years of our recent history it's not like 1979 1979 saw a momentous shift in our external environment you had the the revolution in iran you had the soviet invasion of uh, afghanistan you had this formal establishment of diplomatic relations between the united states and china you had the assassination of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto and a number of other changes. Uh, uh, the judicial assassination, I should say, of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, uh, and therefore a setback for democratic forces in Pakistan, from which they have still not uh, recovered. So, 1979 stands out for its starkness. Similarly, you have 1989, the Soviets' withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan, uh, the Berlin Wall comes down, the Cold War is. Uh, over you have tiananmen square in uh, in china the beginnings of the insurgency in uh, kashmir again our external environment is dramatically uh, altered and nothing remains uh, uh, the same and you can come down i mean if you look at 911 and 2001 the global war on terror again dramatically alters our external environment uh, and perhaps if we look back on our own recent history maybe 2000 Twenty uh, one will also stand out as that kind of a year for various reasons because of changes in Afghanistan, changes in Pakistan, changes in our own relationship with with China, 
uh, the U.S.-China relationship, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, 2011, which is somewhere in between this period, does it have that same kind of uh, uh, salience? And this is really the second part of Ambassador Fabian's title: uh, that did something happen or not? Now, I think in India we need to pay much more attention to what happens in our uh, Western uh, neighborhood, and in fact, we don't. So while we do speak a great deal about the Indo-Pacific, uh, we in fact really follow the Americans and the rest of the Western narratives in seeing the Indo-Pacific as a region which is east of, to our east. We don't really see the wider expanse of uh, the Indian Ocean uh, to, our, to our west. And therefore, we often don't focus to the same extent, except perhaps now to a greater extent on the Arabian Gulf, but we don't really focus on our Western, the wider Western neighborhood, which really stretches all the way to uh, Africa, because that is the uh, that is the reach of the Indian uh, Ocean and therefore of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and there is, I think, a problem there because, uh, to my mind, the importance of books such as this is to highlight the the significance of our Western neighborhood because we cannot approach it in the same way as we approach our Eastern neighborhood. Our Eastern and Western wings are quite dramatically different and they have been for the last 40 or 50 years. The entire Eastern neighborhood is crisscrossed by intergovernmental uh, agreements. You have ASEAN, you have ASEAN plus three, ASEAN plus six, the East Asia summit uh, process. There are all kinds of inter economic, uh, economic factors which have Tightened, tightly bound the region uh, together. And, and while there is a great deal of political uh, conflict, these intergovernmental agreements uh, dampen that conflict. They moderate it. They provide, they provide avenues for that conflict, if not to be resolved, at least to be mitigated. And one example in our own neighborhood is what is, is, what is happening in, uh, in Myanmar. Uh, because there are issues concerning Myanmar, but we can always deal with them at a step removed because you say that there is ASEAN to deal with uh, Myanmar. There is the intergovernmental arrangement, there are regional arrangements which are designed precisely to address those kind of issues. Now, as compared to this, when you look to our West, it's like a, it's like, uh, it's like a zoo. Uh, there are no, there are no interlocking regional intergovernmental uh, agreements. You have India versus Pakistan, India, Pakistan versus Afghanistan, Iran versus the rest, uh, versus Saudi Arabia, etc., etc., etc. There are no factors which mitigate uh, conflict. So it's much closer to, uh, to being set off uh, almost at the slightest uh, provocation. And uh, despite all the efforts which Ambassador Talmi Zahmad and Ambassador Fabian and many great Arabists have made, uh, and of course, scholars from the Jawaharlal Nehru University and other places have made, somehow West Asia doesn't grab our attention in the same way as uh, our Eastern neighborhood, uh, uh, neighborhood does. And there are obvious, uh, there are obvious uh, reasons why this is not a good state of affairs. Uh, our hydrocarbon relationship with the West, the number of Indians who live and work over there, the extent of our dependence on their uh, remittances, uh, and also the fact that from 1979 onwards, whatever has happened uh, to our West has had a profound impact on our own national uh, security in very directly political uh, terms. So these are really the thoughts which occurred to me when I went through this wonderful book. Some parts of it I found absolutely fascinating because it does show the role which uh, uh, Western countries have played uh, at critical periods of the history of different uh, countries in this region, and what a what a negative in, uh, impact that had. The case of Libya uh, stands out, but there's also Syria. There's also uh, other other country situations which are examined uh, very very brilliantly in this book. Uh, so, with these remarks, I'll again thank uh, Dr. Munshi and the IIC. Uh, for inviting me to be part of this wonderful panel. Thank you very much.
I have been ordered to come here repeatedly because the things are being recorded back there. Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed doesn't need any introduction. And the introduction have already been made by the by our librarian, Ms. Munshi. These are not, these are very known people, at least in the IIC. So may I request Ambassador Ahmed to take the floor? Please come here. First, let me start on a personal note. I, I arrived in Saudi Arabia in January 2011 to do my second stint as ambassador. And I had all of one year, eight months left of service. And my, my focus at that time was primarily on promoting Indo-Saudi relations and my extension India's ties with the Gulf, with the region. The Prime Minister came there within a month of my arrival. We signed the Riyadh Declaration, which had at its subtitle, A New Era of Strategic Partnership. And from that time, we had a certain very substantial political content to the relationship. And that is what preoccupied me during this period. Far away from my location in Riyadh were certain things that were happening in Tunis, in Tunisia, very far away, particularly in December 2011. And I want to confess to you, 30 years in the region, I had no interest whatsoever in what was happening in Tunisia. And abruptly, all of that changed. Because in early January, Zain al Abedin bin Ali arrived in Jeddah. So the Tunisians got rid of their problem and the Arab Spring became my problem. Completely transformatory. And I want to share with you a sense of extraordinary euphoria. An abandoning of all diplomatic restraint and a sense of participating in something much larger than ourselves. When you struggled, when I used to write my dispatches to the ministry, I have the great credit of being the most prolific writer and the least read diplomat in our service. A badge that I proudly carry. And I, I used to struggle with words because prose was not enough. My first dispatch began with the first paragraph of the tale of two cities. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, etc. And then you needed poetry. English poetry was not, of course, the mention of Wordsworth is here. To be young was very heaven. And then I thought of our Indian writer, Josh Maliabadi, Kya Hind ka zanda kaap raha hai? And that is the kind of spirit in which my dispatches went to the ministry. I followed the Arabic media very closely, all across. We used to get translations done and used to impose them on the ministry. Translations of what is the region saying? And I want to share with you, though it is, a, it is an effort to recall that, the region was truly euphoric. For the first time, you sensed the Arab actually believing that he could control his own destiny. The hopeless life that he had led over 200 years. He truly believed at that moment that things will change. And I shared some of those quotations from a variety of writers, including in Saudi Arabia. And they said, you cannot put this back. The Arab Spring has changed the history and geography and culture of the Arab person. Absolute joy. Absolute joy. And then it all ended on 14th, 15th March 2011. Absolute shock. Overnight, the Saudi troops, along with the UAE, 
went across the King Fahad Causeway, a causeway that I had traversed several times to, uh, to enjoy the spiritual comforts of Bahrain. And then I found these pictures of these troops going across. The GCC Peninsula Shield, they called it, but it was primarily Saudi and some sprinkling of UAE and a pretended Qatari brigade uh, a bunch. About a thousand or so people. It changed immediately. And we therefore, that entire euphoria was buried and it never resurrected again. Till then, we had seen the fall of Zainal Abedin bin Ali, of Hosni Mubarak, later of Ali Abdullah Saleh, and then you had Gaddafi in a set of circumstances quite different, because that was an imperialist assault on a sovereign country, a different pattern. This is the background in which we have the Arab Spring. And the sense of deep despondency that pervaded the entire region. The same euphoric writers started singing a different song. And there was no longer that prose and that poetry anymore. It was all about, oh, we have got rid of this. There was an abuse of Islamic uh, authorities and political Islam. There was an abuse that there was a recalling of the idea of fitra, chaos in the Arab world. Now you cannot rise against a legitimate authority. Things like that. All absolute rubbish. And that is how it all withered away. When we now look back, we can see that events in West Asia not only impinge on the region as a whole, all the way from Iran up to Morocco, they have had tremendous impact on world affairs as well. You've had a constant effort at changing this, the situation. The opposition to colonial rule and imperial rule all through the 19th century, very little recorded. Many of us don't even know the massive uprise and the extraordinary violence which France and Britain perpetrated against the Arabs. Hundreds of thousands of people killed with massive bombardments all across North Africa. The most barbaric colonialism and colonial experience that we can experience. All of it whitewashed from history because they were the civilization that had come into the region. A barbaric region. And this is their, their civilization was overwhelmingly weaponry and humiliation and therefore the engendering of despair. There is a very deep, there is when we speak of the 19th century, the Arab world was extraordinarily alive and creative. We refer to it as the Renaissance, just as we had a Renaissance. Great scholars came up. They traveled, they learned French and they learned English and they read all that literature. And they truly believed mistakenly that these Westerners were going to be their partners in change. They never realized that these Westerners have no interest in change. They have interest in domination. The world, the region led from the front, the anti-colonial movement. It saw the shift in 1956 from the old imperial and colonial order into the new imperialism of the Cold War led by the United States. It saw in 1979 the centrality of Islam as a very significant political force in world affairs. Starting with the Islamic revolution in Iran, spreading out with the assault on the Haram Sharif, and then the Soviet occupation and the very cynical and opportunistic conversion of an Afghan national struggle into a global jihad, engineered by the United States, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. A very cynical and opportunistic effort, the implications of which are still with us all these decades later. And then, of course, we experienced in 1991 the hubris of the hegemon. 
the sole hegemon. The Cold War was over. The United States used its firepower to destroy Iraq and to reverse the occupation. But having done that, they stayed on. And the sanctions inspections regime, the no-fly zone, the dual containment, all of these, they took their eye off that monster they had created in Afghanistan. And, and when they were unfocused entirely, pursuing an Israeli agenda all across West Asia, you found the assault upon the United States homeland in 9-11. For the Americans, history begins on that day. But those of us who have followed West Asia, history began many decades earlier. The gross misconduct of these powers was responded to. And this is the pattern. And now you see in the last two decades, the decline of the hegemon. The mistake after mistake that this hegemon made, Afghanistan and Iraq, and created massive forces of resistance. That is today the downfall of this hegemon that we are witnessing today. And that again tells you the central role of West Asia. The Arab Spring is today, in some case, ways, it is an ongoing effort. Because the effort of resistance has never abated. The Arab person has never given up his resistance to tyranny at home and intervention and interference abroad, from abroad. That pattern has continued. It has had different shapes because different instrumentalities have been used against these two twin tyrannies. Two twin tyrannies that actually supported each other and fed each other. So we have now many things that are still with us. Directly as a consequence of the Arab Spring, the Iran-Iraq, the Iran-Saudi divide, and the shaping of sectarianism as a factor in regional affairs, the rise of the Islamic State as a force of resistance to American occupation. The, and then, of course, it reverberated elsewhere. Because as you had these broken states unleashing refugees and refugees that went across the Mediterranean into South Europe and went across into Western Europe through Turkey, you had the rise of Islamophobia, you had the rise of populism, and you had the consolidation of right-wing governments all across the so-called enlightened world of Western Europe and the United States. There was another thing that happened during this period. During the Arab Spring, the last decade that we have seen, the steady erosion of US influence, credibility, and authority. The expectations with regard to, the Amer uh, with regard to Americans were very high. And their capacity to deliver was extremely low. They had no clue about what they had got themselves into. Cluelessness is the central feature of American involvement. Sometimes for two decades in a particular region or country with no knowledge whatsoever about the dynamics of that country. Nobody can say that they know anything about Afghanistan or about Iraq. And yet they were there for 20 years and we are told they spent $4 trillion. Look at the extraordinary waste, the extraordinary damage and the extraordinary destruction that is their enduring legacy in the region. What then are we now left with? We see the manifestation of a deep state. This word, I'm told, has a lot of historic value, goes back to the Cold War and possibly even earlier. But it has become the central characteristic of the Arab state. This extraordinary combination of state power, security forces, business elites, religious elements, and the upper middle class, all of them combining together to ensure that a status quo is maintained that subserves their interests. And while they may pretend to use a certain degree of moderation and co-option in their political order, the steel gloves of coercion is available and as time passes 
becomes the weapon of choice to subdue resistance within their political order. You have certain new players in the region, players who used to be extremely, extremely low-key characters. Saudi Arabia and UAE are strategic role players in the region. You didn't hear of them much. They were very low-key. They were forces for moderation. They were forces of accommodation, diplomacy. And now you see them right in the forefront. The war in South Syria and the war in Yemen, extraordinarily destructive, with no result that is apparent. They are an ongoing factor. UAE has become a strategic role player all across the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, and in the Horn of Africa. It actually has bases in these territories and has taken the initiative to reach out to the Israelis and build a certain nexus, a strategic nexus with the Israelis, dragging the Israelis into the Red Sea, into the Gulf of Aden, and into the Gulf of Oman. And yet, this is the same UAE that is also robustly engaged diplomatically with the Iranians. So that is where we have. The question, therefore, arises very often, and this is a question which we all ponder. Is West Asia condemned permanently to authoritarian rule? It is very difficult to answer this. We do not know uh, whether this is going to be the answer, whether there is a permanent answer to this. When you look at the situation in Africa, the promise after the Rainbow Nation is not particularly, uh, um, has not been well met. Latin America too is enduring a degree of authoritarian rule. So it is not as if West Asia and North Africa are particularly condemned. In fact, you find the rise of authoritarianism even in countries that were till recently moderate and accommodative. But that is what we have to ask ourselves. And even as I raise this question, I have to also look at the other answer, the persistence of resistance. In my book, West Asia at War, I celebrated the persistent resistance of the Palestinian. He has never given up even for a day. And look at the violence that he has endured. The extraordinary uh, bullets that are hammered onto them which the Israelis inflict upon them with impunity because they have a license to kill. That is so there is the persistence of resistance on the one hand and the persistence of authoritarian rule on the other. This is a pattern, a very ugly pattern juxtaposed against each other. You had from 2019, the second phase of the Arab Spring. That no mention of political Islam, all the references were to political reform at that time. And they've talked the language of human rights, of gender equality, of people, of economic reform of the end of uh, uh, crony capitalism, end of corruption, corruption, corruption. This was the watchword that we had and the sound that came now from Iraq and from Algeria and from Sudan and from Tunisia. And that is where it has ended. Because UAE and Saudi Arabia, having crushed the democratic order in Egypt, have turned their guns upon Sudan and on Tunisia. And the one silver lining from the Arab Spring is now no more. And there is a constitutional coup that has ended there. But there is still the persistence of resistance. And that is now I will raise my last question. It is a question that borders all of us and agitates us. As Leo Tolstoy ended his book, War and Peace, there is a very long extended essay at the end. And he asked this first question to us. What moves nations? What moves nations to resistance? He is talking, of course, at that time about the assault that Napoleon had inflicted upon the Russian people and the response that they gave. So there was he extols the spirit of nationalism at, in that context. But is that enough? A, a resistance to an external force is a very powerful unifying 
factor nationalism but can what is the force that we can use against domestic tyranny this is the question that is raised in west asia and the answer perhaps will come from there thank you the book under discussion i'm setting my eyes on this book just now i have not seen it and it looks a very well produced volume congratulations macmillan and congratulations vandana whoever she is please please explain a little more about the production process and maybe some more people will be inspired to come to you knock on your door and look for a publication from macmillan vandana Good evening, everyone. And um, all I'll say is, firstly, thank you very much, Dr. Usha, for having this launch here. Thank you, everyone who's come here, and Ambassador Fabian for reposing trust in us, giving us this responsibility of publishing this fantastic work. I would say, um, I don't think you know uh, people lack the inspiration to come to us. i think it is uh, the sheer volume of beautiful work which comes to us it's just that we are unable to publish all of that but with people sitting here with such literary minds we really look forward to you reaching out to us our details are available here i'll leave them with usha ma'am also and uh, typically when a manuscript is shared with us we try to get it reviewed from a couple of people in this domain who would be able to give us a fair and judicious uh, you know outlook on that because we are obviously not the experts we are the aggregators of all the knowledge and all the literature that you produce so do share your manuscripts with us we'll get them reviewed and then come back to you with timelines on when we can publish those and make them available as much as uh, we you know would like to publish everything i think today we are carrying some books of uh, ambassador fabian which are outside and i would encourage you to take a look at those as well thank you once again so it's time for you people to share your uh, experiences of the last one hour one hour and a half your comments your questions whatever yes please I am Mita Rajiv Lochan from the National Commission for Women, and my question is to Ambassador Fabian. Uh, sir, my question is that uh, the core, perhaps, of democracy is the ability to involve the maximum numbers of persons in the tasks of governance. So, uh, in the countries that you write about. to what extent do you think that those regimes were able to achieve this and uh, is it related to the puzzle that you have posed in your title uh, the arab spring that was and wasn't was this a reason for the terror well, yeah i i see a lot of hands raised so i think we'll take two two more questions and then ambassador fabian will will have answers to them yeah please you have to come uh, my name is <coughs> gp bagai i find that a very pessimistic scenario has been raised but uh, don't you think that with the population of the youth increasing in west asia high population growth with the rise of social media which, which wasn't there in those days when the arab spring took place uh they no longer need inspiration from the developed west but they are able to communicate with each other read much more in the media 
and therefore be inspired by the rest of the world, not by concepts which they could not uh, utilize. So do we need to be so pessimistic or do you expect that things will change much faster because of all uh, exposure? I think I take one more question and I would also appreciate if Ambassador Ahmed and Ambassador Raghavan also respond to all these questions. Yes, yes. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Vivekan Sundi. I work in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, work in Abu Dhabi. Um, two questions. One, um, it was a more subtle uh, process that happened. And so people talked about uh, Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, what took advantage of the spirit of the people? So if someone can address what were the complications, it wasn't so simple as good versus evil or uh, lovely young men and things like that. So were these societies ready for a democratic transformation? Did other people take advantage of it? Uh, second question is on, when we look back, I mean, how does it help to paint this picture of U.S. as the unbridled evil? And I remember um, USSR was, I mean, if you if you ask where are the maximum number of landmines, single person landmines, mm. they're in Afghanistan. The Soviets left them there. They bombed the villages. So uh, no, uh, no certificate for the Americans, but what were the Soviets doing? I mean, you could have a name like Democratic Republic or something, but it was obvious there was a tyrant there. So what was, again, the subtlety in superpower relations in the Middle East? So, um, so yeah, if Andira, so senior diplomats say if they can comment on both aspects. It's a good exercise to walk up and down, and I'm just making sure that uh, you know you can it ca captures my head also. <laughs> if I get too close or too far, then it's a problem. So I'm glad that uh, Dr. Munshi approves. <laughs> now, with your permission, I'll start with the last question first. That was about, uh, you know, giving United States, uh, what shall I say, a bad character certificate uh, and uh, what happened in Afghanistan. Yes, I think there is merit in that question. In fact, under the moon, there is nobody who is 100% good or 100% evil. But to come specifically to Afghanistan, 24th of December, 1979, Bersinski, National Security Advisor of President Carter, he sends a message to his president, congratulations, you have given them their Vietnam. Meaning, America has given <clears throat> to the Soviet Union their Vietnam. Now, what is the story behind it? Wyszynski was born in Poland. He wanted to make sure that the Soviet military will be engaged elsewhere if uh, in East Europe they start asking for freedom. He got permission from Carter to send the special forces to Afghanistan sometime in July and uh, well uh, 71 I think I can be wrong about the date about the year but anyway uh, as soon as the communist government took over in Kabul and uh, they fomented revolts here there and there and there and the government in Kabul had no idea that the special forces were at work so they went to Moscow they talked to Brezhnev, who, without 
a proper cabinet meeting, he had his kitchen cabinet, and it was decided to send forces to uh, Afghanistan. I see the former ambassador of Bangladesh to Afghan uh, to Soviet Union there. I'm sure he can tell us more about what happened between Brzezinski, Carter, and Brezhnev. Okay, so, you know, I would just repeat that, you know, in the sublunar world, nobody is always good or always bad. Now, there was another part about, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood and all that. Well, let's take Egypt. What happened was that uh, Mubarak fled. The military took over. In fact, Mubarak said that he was handing over power to the military. Now, he had no business to do that because under the constitution, the SCAF, you know, the Supreme Armed Forces Council had no business. Supreme Council of the Armed Forces had no business. There's no mention of it in the constitution. It should have been either the prime minister or if you're a vice president or the speaker. Anyway, army took over and then the army found that um, you know, they were not very popular because people got disenchanted, people wanted election and this and that. Then the Muslim Brotherhood and the army got into a contract, you know, Machiavellian act on the part of both. Only thing is that uh, the SCAF was able to, they played a smarter or dirtier game. So what happened was that the Muslim Brotherhood, they contested the election, they got the majority, then they got the presidency. But once they got the presidency, the SCAF, actually the deep state, which, you know, uh, Ambassador Talmis mentioned. In fact, in Egypt, the deep state consists of the military, uh, the security, intelligence, the, uh, you know, the, uh, corporate and the media. Media comes under the corporate. <laughs> so the deep state, uh, you know, sort of worked and uh, this uh, tamarod, you know, the rebel, they materialized from nowhere. I mean it, it's in the book. They materialized from nowhere. And then the media said that they had got 15 million signatures. The media said that on a particular day, there were 11 million people. It's all bunkum nonsense because it has been calculated, you know, with the available space, you cannot have so many people. Anyway, so that is what happened. That is, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was outwitted by the deep state. And there was a guy called Suwaris, uh, you know, he's very rich. Uh, he got a 2.1 billion tax notice from uh, Morsi. And he's the one who funded, and also UAE. And Tony Blair also was there. So I have listed all the people, you know, who were behind uh, bringing down Morsi. Well, <clears throat> there was a question about, um, you know, pessimistic, why should we be? There is a social media. So it is possible to have a change in the positive direction. Yes, I agree. But you know, the social media cuts both ways. The social media can be used by the deep state or by the people, those who want a more democratic setup. And uh, I have it, I could be wrong. I have an uneasy feeling that at the moment, it is those who want to abuse the social media who have more clout. And uh, Pegasus applies. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that there is Pegasus in India. I have no idea. <laughs> is the Supreme Court still looking at it? I don't know whether anyone is looking at it. Any. So that is that. And uh, then my 
dear friend Meeta had uh, asked uh, a question about democracy. Now, I have a section which deals with uh, the question. You see, there is a belief among some people that uh, democracy and Islam can't go together. Francis Fukuyama, uh, Huntington, and others and others have said, how can it be? In fact, uh, they say that there was no democracy when uh, the prophet was there and the immediate uh, successors, there was no democracy. Now, I have asked the question, which century are we talking about? Now, at that time, what was there in the West? Was there democracy in the West when <laughs> the three good uh, successors of the prophet were ruling? So what I'm trying to say is that, uh, you know, among some Western thinkers, there is a prejudice against Islam. You know what I mean? They cannot look at Islam with an open mind. And then they say that, you know, they are incompatible. Look at Indonesia. Are there Muslims there? Is it democratic? Malaysia? So the thesis that democracy and Islam are incompatible is wrong. But at the same time, it is also true that Islam has to do a lot of introspection and, you know, how to handle the, fail, uh, for, uh, the problems of the day. Of course, one can look at the holy book, but one should also look at the current realities. It's a question of combining. It's a take of, question of taking a holistic approach. Now, it is not, I'm not sure whether that holistic approach is being taken. And then there is other problem about democracy. The West just consistently stood in the way of democracies coming into the Islamic world. I have explained 1882. You know, there was a democracy movement in Egypt. I mean, it was sort of a, you know, um, that is the king will be just a head of state, you know what I mean? Uh, but there will be election and the prime minister, the cabinet and all that will be from the parliament. So they agreed. But then what happened? The British, uh, London and Paris, they had lent a lot of money to the king and they were sure that if democracy comes, they won't get their money back. So they sent the gunboats. Actually, London sent the gunboats. Paris wanted to, but then there was a change of government in Paris. So they didn't. And the man who did it, you know, who stood up for democracy, he was sent to Ceylon, and I think he died there. That was 1882. 1953, everyone, we all know what happened in Iran. Mossadegh, nationalization of the company, oil company, and they were moving towards democracy. Well, the Brits told the Americans, let's take some military action. Americans said, no. The CIA came onto the scene and I read somewhere, but I can be corrected. They spent hardly $10,000 <laughs> to restore the Shah and Shah. And with Mubarak, the West was very happy. As I said earlier, the BBC guy said when uh, uh, Ben Ali in Tunisia fell, oh no, this is not going to affect uh, Egypt. Egyptians don't have the gumption to stand up. You know, they will accept anything. This is what I call wish becoming father to thought. I, the West likes Mubarak, ergo Mubarak will be always there. So the West has a preference for non-democracy, absence of democracy in the Arab world. Uh, have I left out anything? Yes, 
Uh, I'm not suggesting that uh, the people don't have any agency, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, if uh, there is Western support for the autocrats, it makes it more difficult for the people to assert themselves. You take Egypt, for example. I was told that, you know, suppose there is a demonstration of 50 people, the number of policemen will be 120. You see? But in spite of all that, you know, they organized themselves and uh, Mubarak had to flee. But then for other reasons which you explained, you know, LCC came and uh, in my view, subject to correction is much worse than Mubarak. Well, very briefly, since Ambassador ABN has already touched on most, both the points, but uh, about democracy, uh, I think we need to look at it uh, more closely because the question is not so much about Islam and democracy, but whether there is a specific Arab predicament with regard to uh, agency for civil societies. Uh, and I think uh, there it's a more complex issue to answer. The fact that you have democracy in Indonesia and Malaysia uh, is not comparable because they are, they are societies and polities far removed from the Arab world with a different history uh, uh, since uh, at least uh, the late uh, 19th uh, century uh, and different histories of struggle, uh, both against imperialism and also against uh, domestic, uh, for change in domestic. Uh, I think in the Arab world, uh, the nature of Ottoman rule uh, and uh, the character of its decline really has cast a longer shadow uh, than one assumes, than one normally uh, concedes, because how nations were created in the aftermath of uh, uh, Ottoman, Ottoman decline and uh, uh, that raises the question of interface between nationalism and democracy, which really uh, uh, brings you back to the issue of how, why do civil society, why do civil societies lack uh, agency? I think it's uh, it's it's not a. I don't think it's an open and shut case. I think there is a specific Arab uh, predicament, and while it is true what Ambassador Talmi Zamet said that Arab intellectuals. Uh, uh, engaged a great deal uh, from uh, the mid 19th century with uh, modernity, but uh, we do need to look at it uh, more closely about the nature of that uh, engagement, because there are, to my, I'm not an expert, but to my mind, there are differences in that interface uh, or in that engagement with modern, modernity than of the kind we had in South Asia. Uh, so uh, it's not so much Islam or Hinduism uh, but really about a specific Arab predicament, as I uh, said. The second point was about the U.S. Uh, uh, the U.S. role, and is it uh, is it uh, okay to uh, accord so much responsibility responsibility to it? Well, it is true. The the imperial record in the Arab world, in West Asia, in South Asia, uh, speaks for itself from the 18th. Uh, century and nobody can uh, hold a brief uh, uh, for that. But the United States, and it has made terrible mistakes. We are at the aftermath of uh, the first decade, first, uh, it's the first anniversary of what happened uh, in Afghanistan and Kabul last uh, year. So they have made terrible mistakes. But uh, the point is that much of the critique of what we have developed of, of the United States. Uh, and of uh, Western policy in West Asia is really borrowing from a Western vocabulary. It is a Western narrative. Much of the information which we have uh, gathered about what the United States, its acts of omission and commission has been generated from within the United States itself. And that is the great strength of that society. That even as it makes so many mistakes, there are other, uh, there are other institutions, this, civil and political society has a certain strength
to develop critiques of its own uh, institutions which wield uh, power. And that is why it is able to sustain that power, notwithstanding these great mistakes from generation after generation. Nobody can say today that the United States is a power in the decline. There are other powers which are rising, but I don't think we can write off the United States as a power uh, on the decline. And certainly there is something in that society which enables it to uh, critique its own actions and thereby notwithstanding the great mistakes it has made move on uh, uh, from them. And as I said, the fact that we borrow so much of Western vocabulary uh, in uh, critiquing uh, those uh, countries uh, does suggest to me that uh, there is a more complex place uh, process at work uh, than simply this malign Western hand uh, behind everything which has gone wrong. Thank you. The issue of democracy is a complex subject. Which countries are today democratic? What is the nature of this democracy? Do we just have the structures of a democratic order without the informing spirit and soul, whether the institutions that should uphold democratic systems have corroded from within and today are hollow shells. All of these are contemporary dilemmas. And if there is any introspection to be done, it's an introspection that should be of a global character. All civilizations, all communities, all nations should be concerned about these issues that are now today with us. I have studied West Asia in some detail and I have grappled in the course of my research to understand some of the, uh, some of the issues that emerged which led to a certain state of affairs. There is this tendency to speak in generic terms which is actually quite contrary. It actually makes historical analysis difficult. The Arab, the Muslim, these are two generic terms which today distort our understanding of an entire community all the way in West Asia, North Africa, because we speak of the Arab as if there is a collective Arab. But when you look at the history of this region over the last 2,000 years, there are very different people with very different trajectories. Even through the 19th and 20th century, their historical experiences were very diverse. Historically, we used to speak at one point about the Gulf and West Asia and North Africa because of their different historical experiences. I also want to inject a kind of comparative note. Latin America, bastion of democracy for two centuries, one century. Do we ever reflect on, is there something inherently wrong with Roman Catholicism that has made the monsters that have ruled Latin America for so long and have condemned that entire continent to despoilation and violence, extraordinary violence. Every country in Latin America Till very recently has experienced this kind of extraordinary violence against its own people, aided and abetted by the great masters just north of the border. Africa, bastion of democracy. All people living in peace and harmony. Great people. Free elections, voting. So we have problems when we do this analysis that you focus on one particular demon. How did this happen? Do recall here that all through the Cold War, Islam, the faith and Muslims, the people were allies of the West against godless communism, which is why the United States has no hesitation in mobilizing quote-unquote Islam 
as an instrument against the Soviet occupation. India at that time took a principled position against this, saying that feet should not be injected for political purposes. Extraordinary wisdom and depth of understanding. Totally absent in the Western milieu and certainly opportunistically Saudi Arabia and Pakistan were quite happy to go along with that. And I have analyzed this as to why they were partners with the Americans in this regard. You will also remember when we fall of Brezhensky. Brezhensky began the onslaught on the Soviet Union several months before the Soviet intervention in December 1979, perhaps a year earlier. And much later, when he was asked about the Al-Qaeda and the scourge of Al-Qaeda, and he said, I still stand by what we had done in Afghanistan because we, we won the Cold War. And the price that we paid of some stirred up Muslims was a price worth paying. So there was a certain strategic purposes that were behind this. So let's not get carried away about Islam, the faith and the Arab people. And there's something uniquely deficient about Arab character which makes them unfit. My own narrative is completely different. I have seen this people struggling to be masters of their own destiny. There has not been a moment in Arab history when they have not struggled. Where I have found the pattern is where the continent is rich in resources. Latin America, Africa and West Asia, extremely rich in resources. Resources essential for Western economic repair after the world wars and economic domination thereafter. This is the key. For West Asia, it is oil. The most significant strategic asset in West Asia, which was crucial for Western military prowess, to a lesser extent in the First World War, and overwhelming in the Second World War. And the entire pattern of Western politics in West Asia was connected with ensuring that the domination over oil remains a Western preserve and does not go into the hands of the other side. So do recall that there are these various interventions that have occurred in continents and amongst people which have retarded their political progress overwhelmingly because of the resource factor that has come in the way and which has, which has supported Western imperialism. When did the West, when did the Arab ever give up the Arab person, the individual, not the ruler? The Arab person never gave up on his desire for participation in his political order. He has been let down by leaders from time to time. There was a certain idealization of Nasser and then the great downfall with 1967 that could never be repaired. And the quick advantage that Saudi Arabia took of this debacle to place Islam at the heart of West Asian politics with the setting up of the OIC in 1979, uh, of, this, of the Rabat summit in 1969, and the OIC in 1971. The Western East, every one of, Arab, of the Arab tyrannies, just as every one of the tyrannies in Latin America and Africa has been sustained by Western power. Let there be no mistake about that. That is true. And every time there has been a genuine desire for freedom and for democratic systems, the people have been assassinated in coup d'etat. Maybe it is Patrice Lamumba, as we will, some of us will recall. Do recall here the history of our own country, how much the Americans attempted to subvert the first cabinet of Jawaharlal Nehru and to replace him. It is there. Inadvertently, it emerges. They had molds in the cabinet and they had, they had actually planned a coup, a cabinet coup to unseat Nehru. And can any one of us ever say that the American intervention in Indian politics has abated? It is a constant effort, but we have held our own so far and we will continue to do that. So this has the democratic system and popular participation have nothing to do with the identity of a people 
or the faith they might enjoy at a, at they might pursue at a particular time it has a lot to do with external interventions that retard their progress look at the state of affairs in pakistan pakistan is not particularly deficient but all of us know pakistan was constructed in order to subserve western interests which it has fully done in terms of its elite being allied with the pakistan with the western alliance right from the beginning from the very beginning and they have been compensated the strong support the western powers gave to pakistan in terms of the jammu and kashmir issue and the military support that the pakistanis have enjoyed is all of that is part of this pattern it has nothing to do with islam or muslim people so let us be very clear here there is this business of the moment the business about the united states the united states post when it became the hegemonic power is extraordinarily violent and ruthless you will remember some of you where the iraqi children were deliberately starved and half a million people starved under the sanctions inspection regime and mart uh, and albright was asked do you think that this was a price worth paying half a million iraqi children starved to death because of absence of food and medical supplies and the us sanctions and she said in the interview it was a price worth paying the great mother of democracy half a million era one and a half million iraqis died during the sanctions inspections regime half a million of them children in the in the case of afghanistan 200000 afghans were dead in the case of the iraq occupation the first day 2003 the first day 100000 iraqis were dead they bombed air raid shelters they bombed indiscriminately they killed thousands upon thousands of people and that is what happened and finally 400000 um, uh, officially 400000 unofficially arab sources say one and a half million iraqis died in the 20 year occupation has anyone heard the word american diplomacy you've heard of the american military power they are brilliant people and brilliant minds and i applaud their sources yes there are sources that i have read and used which have been critical but the united states is a very unique order the consensus that you find it is also a deep thing it also has a consensus it also has an elite that benefit from a certain system there is the arms lobby the arms lobby is central to american politics subserved by various other lobbies like the israel lobby and a few others but this is central and there is a consensus no american president ever will be able to stand up to the uh, arms lobby and the arms lobby thrives on and benefits from violence let us be very clear about that consistently and that is why you always hear this propensity to use violence to subserve american interests there is no comparison i am not talking about the cold war post cold war we have had 30 years of that look at how many people the americans have killed count on your feet how many countries became democracies as a result of american intervention people give me the example of japan and germany totally devastated one with the atom bomb and one with the absolute bombardment so that they had nothing left and then of course you shaped a democratic order which ensured that they were allies of the west and never became independent countries not once in the last 75 to 80 years those are the two countries that are mentioned to us as democracies as a result of direct american intervention can anyone name a third please join me giving a big round of applause to all the speakers the discussions were hot illuminating erudite and of course raised lots and lots of questions and i'm sure if we continue for another one hour we'll have a discussion yes and i still wonder whether ambassador fabian will now change and with or 
<laughs> read this. Yes. Please do come here. Oh, the, this is an Indian edition which is being sold outside. Please buy this. This is half the price of what you might have seen. So that was an international edition. This is the Indian edition. That's why it is half the price. Yeah. <laughs> Once again, uh, thank you very much to the distinguished speakers and to the wonderful audience. Thank you very much. Thank you.